you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out on this cold night. Uh, I'm honored to introduce the author and speaker tonight, Penny Rosenwasser, who I've just met today, but I have read her book months ago and was really impressed. I personally endorse it. And um, I want to tell you just a little bit about, about it. Um, it's called Hope into Practice, Jewish Women Choosing Justice Despite Our Fears. It is an award-winning book, and uh, I'll just tell you two of the five that, of awards that I have written down here. One is from the Association for Women in Psychology, the 2014 Jewish Caucus Award for Scholarship, and it's also a winner of the Social Change category of the 2014 USA Best Book Awards. Uh, it's very readable, very accessible to anybody who is interested in activism, uh, certainly around women's activism as well as Jewish activism in Palestine, Israel. Um, Penny is a, life, a lifelong heartfelt rabble rouser for justice. That describes her really well. She earned her PhD at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco in transformational learning and change. Penny is a former Jewish caucus chair of the National Women's Studies Association. She's also a founding board member of Jewish Voice for Peace. She teaches anti-Semitism and anti-Arabism class with a Palestinian colleague at the City College of San Francisco. Um, she hails from the Bay Area. Help me warmly welcome Penny Rosenwasser. Thank you, Tirza. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, yeah, huge thanks to the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center for bringing me. And um, Tirza actually told me to approach them to get here, so I'm very grateful. Um, I used to live in Steamboat Springs, so it's kind of fun to be back in Colorado. Um, and also, I wanted to thank all the co-sponsors for coming. Um, so the Peace Center has asked me to talk about is opposing Israeli policies anti-Semitic um, so that involves talking about anti-Semitism, Zionism, anti-Zionism, and how these are all different and how that relates to working for a just peace in Israel and Palestine. Um, though I am I'm a very proud, active member of Jewish Voice for Peace, tonight I represent myself. Um, and I'm also going to be weaving in some readings from the book. Um, and uh, again, I have them on sale over here. We do take credit cards. I would love it if you buy one so we don't have to schlep them all back to Oakland. That would be great. Um, before we go any further, I just wanted to acknowledge my heart really goes out to the families of the three young Muslim students who were killed in their own apartment just a few weeks ago. Uh, Dia Shadi Barakat, 23, Syrian heritage. His wife, Yusor Mohammed, 21. Palestinian, and her 19-year-old sister, Razan Abu Salha, also Palestinian. Before we go on, I see tonight is also about community building. So I want to ask you to just take 30 seconds and turn to someone, ideally someone you don't know. If you don't know them, tell them, introduce yourself. But if you do know them, just tell them why you wanted to come tonight. Just, just humor me. Thank you. And also, we have a special treat tonight. Um, tonight is the debut of the Boulder Hope Into Practice Players. The book is uh, a lot of different voices. And so towards the end of my talk, I'm going to be bringing up the Boulder Hope Into Practice Players, Tirza Firestone, Ami Dayan, and Carolyn Beninsky, who are going to be reading some of the selections from the book interspersed with my talk. So you have that to look forward to. I thought I would start by letting you know a little bit about where I come from. Um, my most beloved ancestor, my granddaddy, Moisha Ness, um, came here from Poland. He was, it was the year 1900. He was 12 years old. He came with his brother, who was a few years older. Uh, they came from a little shtetl called Przeslami, which was in southeastern Poland, or the area called Galicia. It's now, if you look on a map now, you see that it really looks like it's in the Ukraine. And their mother had just died, and they came escaping poverty and anti-Semitism. 
Um, they came through Ellis Island, and Granddaddy immediately got a job in a sweatshop on the Lower East Side, uh, sweeping the floor of a necktie factory. And um, pretty soon he got promoted to sewing women's skirts. But he was working, you know, 12 hours a day, five, six days a week. He couldn't go to school, but sometimes at night he could go to Hebrew school. Um, by the time he was in his early 20s, he'd managed to save a little bit of money. So when a relative wrote him from South Carolina and said, there's some really good jobs here in dry goods stores, that was the name then for clothing stores, um, you should come down. So he did. And pretty soon he had enough money to buy his own clothing store. His sister Annie pawned her wedding ring to help him have the money. And that's where he raised my mom and her four siblings. It was a little town called Denmark, South Carolina. 2,000 people. They were one of two Jewish families. Um, on the weekends, Granddaddy would drive his sons round trip several hours to go to Hebrew school. Um, but on Sundays, he taught Bible study at the local Baptist church. <laughs> he was the most learned biblical scholar in the town. Fast forward to the 1950s, Alexandria, Virginia, suburbs of Washington, D.C., where I grew up. It was a very white, Christian, middle-class area. What I remember is people often looking at me and saying, gee, Penny, you don't look Jewish. And I would shrug my shoulders and say, thank you. That's what I thought I was supposed to say. Uh, much later, I remembered that and was horrified. Um, I think it's just an indicator of the anti-Semitism that was in the air in those white, Christian, middle-class, 1950s suburbs of Washington, D.C. I don't remember overt anti-Semitism coming at me, but I was born four years to the day after the last death march left Auschwitz. Um, I went to Temple Bethel Sunday School, was confirmed. We had the Hanukkah menorah in the window, and we had a Christmas tree. We celebrated Christmas. My parents wanted us to blend in and belong as American. I never felt comfortable in my Jewish skin. I wanted to be cool, like the Christian kids. Um, I'll leave that story there, but part of, part of my book does talk about my process of combating the effects of assimilation and reclaiming what I'd call my loud, proud Jewishness. Um, part of why I'm a very proud member of Jewish Voice for Peace. I feel like my Jewishness really grounds my social justice activism. It's clapping over there. <laughs> um, the last chapter of the book is called Choosing Justice Despite Our Fears, and it advocates for changing unfair systems, including changing US policies regarding Israel and Palestine, calling for security, equality, dignity, equal rights for Palestinians as well as for Israelis, and an end to the occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. Um, I belong to Kahila Synagogue in Oakland, and one of my rabbis, David J. Cooper, in his High Holy Day sermon named Israel-Palestine, quote, the single greatest ethical issue facing the Jewish people in the 21st century, unquote. Of course, this is not just a Jewish issue, but I take his words seriously. Um, so in order to know if opposing Israel's policies are anti-Semitic, we need to clarify what anti-Semitism looks like today. I thought I would start by sharing with you in November, excuse me, October, in Berkeley, I was interviewed on our, our community radio station, KPFA, and I was talking about the book, and afterwards, the radio host forwarded an um, uh, email to me that was sent to her, and this is from the listener. I'm listening to KPFA today, and I found a lot of comments regarding Jews and Jewish oppression to be off the mark. This show is patently ignoring the elephant in the room, which is the Zionist Jewish stranglehold on the United States, the massive overrepresentation of Jewish power, money, and influence on our politics, i.e. APAC and other extremely invasive, powerful Jewish organizations that literally dictate our foreign policy and politics in general, owning over 50% of the media, controlling the news, complete control over Hollywood, etc. Excuse me if I don't shed a tear about the poor Jews in America. The Jews even have controlling interest in public radio. And the person signed it, signed their name. So that's a version of the conspiracy theory, the theme that Jews are taking over the world, still alive and kicking. Um, my friend, the radio host who sent it to me, said, isn't it interesting how talking about anti-Semitism brings it up? 
Um, and of course, it's accurate that there's Jewish prominence in the media and in Hollywood, and there are historic reasons for that. Those were two key areas where Jews could have jobs in this country, um, in the, especially in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, but prominence is not the same as Jewish control. And the culture of power in this country is still predominantly Christian and white and male. Um, and this example also shows economic anti-Semitism, so singling out Jews as scapegoats to take the heat off the class system, you know, that power elite who make the decisions that affect our lives every day. And a small percentage of that power elite are Jews, and the majority are not, and most of them are Christian and some from other backgrounds. And this is not to demonize individual Christians. I assume a lot of folks in the audience are tonight, and I so appreciate your coming and your support. It is to call out a system of Christian hegemony that has historically targeted Jews. Uh, my dear friend and colleague Paul Kivel has actually written a book about this that I recommend. It's called um, Living in the Shadow of the Cross. Um, Austrian journalist Wilhelm Marx coined the term anti-Semitism in the 1870s, especially to stigmatize Jews as racially and biologically inferior. So that's an example of racial anti-Semitism. And of course, Jews are not the only Semitic peoples, but that's the origin of the term. And then there's theologic anti-Semitism, which is you know, the myth that Jews killed Christ. By way of definition, the one that I use, I find most useful, is just seeing anti-Semitism overall as the denigrating, ignoring, exploiting, or violating of Jews, our cultures, our histories, our religion, simply because we're Jews. Um, since tonight is sponsored by a peace center, I thought I would particularly talk about ways that anti-Semitism shows up in our activism around Israel and Palestine. When Jews are collectively held responsible for Israel's actions, instead of holding accountable the Israeli government and the US government, which funds it, funds the occupation, when Jews are seen only as oppressors, when Israel is seen as the root of the world's problems, instead of one of the leading human rights abusers, lest we forget the US bombing civilians in Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Guantanamo, um, the Chinese occupation of Tibet, the Indian occupation of Kashmir. And then um, equating Netanyahu with Hitler and other Holocaust comparisons. You know, the occupation is horrific enough. We don't have to embellish it um, because that's inaccurate. And using that kind of language just demeans our cause. And this is actually a direct quote from my book. Despite heartbreaking similarities in some of the brutality and policies, the Nazis implemented a systematic ideological state decision to exterminate every Jew. What the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, the Israeli state and settlers are doing deserve severe condemnation and resistance, but does not reflect a state plan to murder every Palestinian. Let's pay attention, in Aurora Levens Morales' words, when criticism of Israel does take on a special tone of hatred and contempt that draws on the same poison well as attacking Jewish slumlords as Jews or singling out the Jewishness of one group of developers while never mentioning the religion of the many Christian developers. Israel is a colonial country with a strong right-wing nationalist ideology that does what such regimes do. But overall in this country, there's no other diaspora community that's encountered less prejudice than US Jews. And that's good news. And that's an important point. And also in the US, there's no widely accepted political philosophy or institutional power that promotes anti-Jewish bigotry. Now in parts of Western Europe, um, in connection with Israel-Palestine, there, there has definitely been an increase in violence against visible Jews, um, especially Jews who are wearing yarmulke, prayer shawl, etc., and also attacks on synagogues and cemeteries. Um, in November, 25% of European Jews reported experiencing harassment or an anti-Semitic attack. And I hope you're aware that um, in the last two months, five Jews have been murdered, uh, four at the Kosher Deli in Paris, one in front of the synagogue in Copenhagen, who's guarding a bat mitzvah party, killed just because they were Jews. And then uh, last May in Brussels, 
Four were shot and killed at the Jewish Museum, three of them Jews, one of them a non-Jew. I hope you also probably heard that a Muslim employee at the Parisian kosher supermarket, a 24-year-old immigrant from Mali, Lasana Batili, risked his life to save seven Jews, including a two-year-old child. Um, he herded them into a freezer in the basement, an act for which he was wrestled to the ground and handcuffed by police before he finally managed to convince them of what he was doing and he was able to play a vital role in um, ending the crisis. My friend Corey Levine is a leader of independent Jewish voices in Canada, and she has a blog on the Huffington Post. And she wrote, his sheer courage and humanity in the face of brutality, his unwillingness to make distinctions between people of different faiths is really the message to be gained from the unspeakable carnage in France. Solidarity in the face of bigotry. The Western European attacks that I just mentioned have been made mostly by young Muslims of North African heritage who are enraged at the consistent increase in Israeli state brutality against Palestinians. And so they conflate the state of Israel with these visible Jews. This is anti-Semitism. The context is a social crisis in working class districts where Jews, Arabs, and Africans are often together in the same public housing dealing with poverty and severe unemployment. Former Israeli Knesset member Yuri Avneri said Jews have always been the ideal scapegoat for the European poor. And with the widening gap there between the rich and poor, just like here, the need for scapegoats is rising. And then there's the drastic rise in Islamophobia in Europe, Western Europe, um, an anti-immigrant, anti-Islam climate where young Muslims feel despised, humiliated, and discriminated against. The National Bureau of the French Jewish Union for Peace explained what's underneath some of the anti-Jewish violence by young Muslims. Quote, if you can't harm Israel, some tell themselves, at least you can try to harm its Jewish supporters. The festering wound of the Palestinian question, unresolved because the powerful of the world refuse to resolve it, contributes to the emergence of a desperate and suicidal terrorism. But in terms of anti-Semitism in Europe, I think where the real danger is and what's most important to pay attention to are the two very right-wing parties that have significant uh, representation in Greece and in Hungary. In Greece, it's the Golden Dawn Party, in 2014, they got 20% of the vote. They are anti-immigrant, homophobic, anti-Semitic, believing that Jewish bankers control the banks. Now, of course, the good news is that the Syriza party, the anti-austerity party, just won there. But Golden Dawn is still a substantial force that we need to keep vigilant about. In Hungary, it's the Jobbik party. And they're the strongest far-right party in Europe. They're neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic, anti-Roma, and homophobic. Um, in 200, 200, 2014, one in five Hungarians voted for them. Um, but the key, again, the key targets of white supremacy in Europe right now are not Jews, but immigrants, mostly Muslims. So there's a lot of pieces to hold here. Um, so let's briefly look again at where the protests against the Israeli attacks on Gaza last summer um, became attacks on Jews. Um, at rallies, rallies protesting the attacks in Brussels, Antwerp, Paris, London, and Germany, both in the rallies and chants and also banners, uh, they said, kill the Jews, slaughter the Jews, gas the Jews, death to the Jews. In Paris, a Jewish pharmacy was destroyed. There were riots outside several synagogues, and firebombs were hurled at two synagogues. And on social media, the hashtag Hitler was right trended on Twitter. UK sociologist Frank Faridi noticed from the European left the leap from criticizing Israel to targeting Jews. And he speculated that the rise of anti-Semitism among some Muslim youth gave permission to others to express more traditional forms of anti-Semitism. Again, from those who feel excluded by society, who are looking for a scapegoat, often having to do with the old accus accusation of Jews, power, and money. 
The director of the European Network Against Racism said blaming only the Islamic fringe for anti-Semitism discounts studies that shows how deeply ingrained it remains among Belgians and other Europeans. And then there was a 2008 Pew study which found that a generally unfavorable view of Jews was held by nearly half of Spaniards, one third of Russians and Poles, one quarter of Germans, and one fifth of the French. Again, significantly, except for Russia, anti-Muslim attitudes were even stronger. Um, I, there's a journalist, I, you, know, you all are familiar with the tablet, it's a kind of a mainstream Jewish online journal, and Yair Rosenberg, one of the journalists, said, most Europeans are not anti-Semitic. And I think that's important. Most Europeans are not anti-Semitic, but those who are prejudiced have become increasingly emboldened. So the conundrum, again, is that the Israeli government oppression of Palestinians keeps triggering this underlying anti-Jewish animosity, anger that fails to distinguish between the acts of governments and the humanity of peoples. But that's also understandable when you look at the behavior of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who fans the flames, himself conflating all Jews with Israel. You know, he claims to represent all Jews and makes the world's Jews responsible for Israeli actions. And of course, that's not true. But that's you know, part of why others fall into that belief. And then what's been happening, especially recently, with these you know, horrific attacks on Jews in Europe, is Netanyahu's been exploiting these attacks to manipulate Jewish fear, telling Jews they aren't safe in Europe, so to frighten Jews into coming to Israel, so that more Jews will come to Israel and outnumber the Palestinians. Um, one more really significant point, and this is in Western Europe, is that the anti-Jewish violence is not state-sponsored. You know, the key government leaders in France, Germany, and Denmark are all speaking out strongly against the anti-Jewish attacks, claiming that attacks on Jews are attacks on them all. Journalist Chris Hedges notes, it's a criminal act in France to mock the Holocaust the way Charlie Hebdo mocked Islam. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into here anti-Semitism um, in the Middle East, which is significant. We could talk about that in the Q&A if you're interested, but I will say that my colleague Mitchell Plitnik, who used to be the director of Jewish Voice for Peace, said, a lot of today's anti-Semitism could be reversed if the Israeli occupation of Palestine ended. And I think that's true. Again, from Yair Rosenberg, hatred of Jews doesn't stem from any one particular group, whether Muslims, the far right, the far left. That's why Jews have historically been blamed for everything from capitalism to communism. <laughs> and as peace activists, I think one of the biggest points I want to make is that, um, you know, it's important to be, certainly important to be concerned about Jews and Jewish safety, but I think the biggest focus needs to be on the underlying conditions that lead to the understandable rage. As peace activists, how can we all join together to mobilize others to eliminate the causes behind the rage and violence? And then before I move on, I, I do want to just briefly talk a little bit about Islamophobia because it's so salient right now in this country and in Europe. Um, Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are deeply connected because Muslims are blamed for what a small segment of Islamists do, just like Jews are blamed for what the Israeli government does. Um, in France, in the first 12 days after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, there were 116 attacks on mosques, or anti-Muslim attacks. Mosques were firebombed, shot at, hit with grenades, pigs' heads were thrown into them, Veiled women were insulted on the street, and there were tons of threats over the internet. In Germany this past January, 40,000 people marched in Dresden with the patriotic Europeans against the Islamicization of the West. And in the US, of course, just as I mentioned, the horrific murders of the three young Muslim students. You may have heard about you know, the whole hoopla around the blockbuster American sniper, and that has spawned a lot of anti-Muslim hate messages on the internet. Um, and you, I hope you're familiar with what world-renowned philosopher Judith Butler calls the grievability factor. Um, New Yorker writer Teju Cole calls it unmournable bodies. How mainstream opinion so quickly decides that certain violent deaths are more meaningful 
more grievable than others. You know, as I think a lot of us know, during the horrific attacks in France, a lot of attention was played play on those murders. At the same time, 2,000 Nigerians were killed by extremists, and there was next to no coverage of that. So how does all this relate to anti-Zionism? Well, I think we can't talk about Israel and Palestine without talking about anti-Semitism, because it was the systematic slaughter of over one-third of the world's Jews, two-thirds of the Jews in Europe just 70 years ago, that drove many terrified Jews to escape to what we now call Israel. Then in 1948, it was Jewish soldiers who expelled half the population of Palestine in just eight months, demolishing towns and villages, displacing over 750,000 Palestinians in what we call the Nakba, or the catastrophe. Um, so European anti-Semitism is one root cause of the Israel-Palestine tragedy. Even though Great Britain, France, and the US were also culpable, and actually Christian Zionists originated the Jewish homeland in Palestine idea three centuries earlier, Israel and Jews are usually held exclusively responsible. When it comes to Zionism, it means a lot of different things. Um, I actually usually don't talk about it, but folks here asked me to talk about it, so I will, trying to follow directions. Um, so here's my perspective. Zionism first emerged as a form of ethnic Jewish nationalism and self-determination in the 1800s, surrounded by other European nationalisms, bent on founding a safe haven for Jews. In the 1880s, the first Zionist settlers in Israel were fleeing, fleeing murderous pogroms in Russia. And then 50 years later, Jews fled to Israel to escape genocide in Europe. And the Allies showed little enthusiasm for sheltering Jewish refugees during or after the war. When the UN vote for partition happened and when they divided up the area that's Israel-Palestine, actually giving more to the Jews, even though there were fewer Jews there at the time, um, when they did this partition, it was their gesture of repentance for the Holocaust. And it also let Western nations off the hook so they wouldn't have to absorb large numbers of Jewish refugees. Um, when the Jewish nation state of Israel was established in 1948, Jews achieved their homeland and a state that privileged Jews over non-Jews. And this is another quote from my book. But aided by the terror of the Holocaust, Zionism became a defensive ideology of survival. We must never again let down our guard. The experience of the Holocaust survivors became the ethos of the state. Israel became the embodiment of persecuted and desperate Jewry. The Jew remained a victim, but now a victim with an army. So Israel was founded on expulsion, as was the United States, Canada, Australia, Zionism was simultaneously a colonizing settler movement that dispossessed Palestinians, and Zionism was also a liberating movement for persecuted Jews. To focus exclusively on one aspect of historical suffering without acknowledging the other is to miss seeing the full picture. So to talk about anti-Zionism, well, if you look at Zionism for the impact on its victims rather than the stated intention of its leaders, you can also see how rejecting Zionism or anti-Zionism is really about rejecting racism and displacement and affirming equality and human rights for Palestinians. Anti-Zionism isn't a Palestinian or a Jewish or a Christian movement, it's a universal movement. And it's a belief that all people have fundamental human rights and then justice needs to be rectified to bring a lasting peace. While anti-Zionism doesn't promote one specific solution, it does hold that many of the policies of Israel today privilege Jews over Palestinians, and so are inherently racist. Um, and this is from an article by progressive Jewish-Israeli journalist Gideon Levy. And this is from Haaretz, which is the, called the New York Times of Israel. He writes, destruction is in our blood. And anyone who criticizes the state is always thought to be using that option, destruction, as a threat. But the state of Israel is an established fact. There's a state here. It will remain here. The battle is over the state's character and, above all, how it is ruled. Now we fight over its justness, not its Zionism. 
So then what's the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Well, I talked about anti-Semitism before. It's the, the disparaging, attacking, stereotyping of Jews simply because we're Jews. Anti-Zionism is an ideology that opposes a Jewish state, an, an ethnocracy, which does not give equal rights to everyone in that state. Anti-Zionism is not inherently against Jewish people. In fact, many anti-Zionists are Jews. Anti-Zionism is for equality and human rights. But if you're criticizing the Israeli state based on a conspiracy theory of world domination, that's no longer anti-Zionism, that's anti-Semitism. Here's an inspiring, if complicated, example. When a Jewish-born writer who championed the Palestinian cause also strongly espoused offensive anti-Semitism and racism, Palestinian leaders publicly disavowed the writer's statements. The Palestinians wrote, quote, our struggle was never with Jews. Our struggle is with Zionism, a modern European settler colonial movement, similar to movements in other, um, where am I? Similar to movements in other parts of the world that aim to displace indigenous people and build new European societies. We reaffirm that there is no room in our struggle for attacks on Jews, nor denying the Holocaust, nor allying with conspiracy theories. Challenging Zionism must never become an attack on Jewish identities. Which all brings us to, is opposing Israeli policies anti-Semitic? Bottom, <clears throat> excuse me, bottom line, it's no more inherently anti-Semitic to oppose Zionism or to criticize Israeli policies than it is inherently anti-American to oppose US policies of war and racism, unless when you're criticizing Israeli policies, you're also demeaning Jews as Jews. Many dissenters against Israeli policies also care deeply about Jews, and I'm sure there are many in this room tonight. So then how is the anti-Semitism charge used to silence criticisms of Israeli critics of Israeli policies, and I, I have three examples I'm gonna share with you. They're all fairly current. You might be familiar with all of them. Um, one sec. In 2005, Palestinian civil society issued a call for nonviolent resistance strategies to end Israel's mistreatment of Palestinians. And for some of you in this room, this might be a little bit scary. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you to stay with me here. Um, because I think we just can't wait to act until all of our wounds are healed. And what I'm talking about, of course, is the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, um, especially divestment from companies that profit from the occupation. These actions are about targeting injustice and pressuring Israel to abide by international law. Because despite countless diplomatic efforts and activist campaigns, the peace process has only slid backwards. You know, the settlements have multiplied by the thousands. Um, Palestinians and Israelis need a just peace now, and these campaigns aim to bring economic and ethical pressure to bear to change behavior. Just like the boycotts of Montgomery, Alabama buses or California table grapes, this is what the U.S. civil rights movement and women's movement and gay liberation movements were all about, nonviolently ending injustice. Last June, the Presbyterian Church USA voted to divest from three companies who profit from the Israeli occupation. And I've been working on this issue for 25 years, and this, I think, is the biggest victory that we've had um, because the uh, Presbyterians are the largest Protestant denomination. After 10 years of soul-searching and debate, in June, the Presbyterian Church's General Assembly voted 110 to 103, so it was a close vote, to stop using their funds to support the building of caterpillar weaponized bulldozers that destroy Palestinian homes. They voted to divest from Motorola, who make the surveillance equipment that is used by Israeli settlements, and to divest from Hewlett Packard, who creates the technology used at Israeli checkpoints. With clear compassion for Jewish suffering, the Presbyterians' vote was grounded in support for Israel's right to exist with peace and security. Their resolution withdraws 21 million investments from these three companies, explicitly targeting these corporations, not Israel. 
yet their decision was met with a firestorm from the Jewish establishment, condemning the Presbyterians as anti-Semitic and threatening to sever long relationships. For example, the liberal-ish Jewish Daily Forward wrote an editorial, Why the Presbyterian Divestment Feels Like Anti-Semitism, complaining that the action was singling out Israel and holding Israel to a higher standard, calling that unfair and anti-Semitic. Jewish Voice for Peace advocacy director Sidney Levy pointed out, what we're talking about is divestment from companies profiting from demolishing Palestinian homes, from targeting civilians, from segregation. It's offensive to say that divesting from such companies is anti-Jewish. I am offended by that, said Sidney. Speaking to the strategy of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, Rabbi Rebecca Alpert points out, Having long decried the violent means that some Palestinians have used, we in the American Jewish community cannot now turn our backs on a Palestinian movement that uses nonviolence to work for peace. Rather, we must do everything in our power to raise Jewish voices, rabbinic voices, and proclaim our solidarity. I have another quote I wanted to read from you about that from my friend Rabbi Margaret Holub. She wrote, I've dedicated my life work to helping the Jewish people grow and blossom. I believe that occupying another people has wounded our people at the root of our collective soul. I see in BDS the hope for healing. Most importantly for the Palestinian people whose homes, livelihoods, and lives are harmed, but also for our own people. I take great hope in the Jewish people and our capacity to do good. So here's another example. Last summer, in the middle of the Israeli onslaught against Gaza, which probably you all know, killed over 2,100 Palestinians, mostly civilians, 260 women, over 500 children, thousands wounded. Um, Palestinian-American professor Stephen Salida posted tweets condemning these attacks. The next thing he knew, the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana terminated his tenure contract to teach American Indian studies before he had even started under pressure from wealthy university donors. They said his tweets were excessively vituperative of Jewish leaders and branded him violent and anti-Semitic. And he had already quit his previous university job, sold his house, had a wife and a young child. The University of Illinois said they were protecting civility because Salida tweeted if, tweeted, if you're defending Israel, you're an awful human being. Salida's termination was part of a clear campaign to silence critics of Israel. Over 17,000 protested the decision, and 3,000 professors are now boycotting the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. And actually, the American Association of University Professors stated that social media expression is private and protected speech. And just as a point of information, um, on his teaching evaluations at his previous job at Virginia Tech, his uh, evaluations were spectacular overall um, and near perfect in the category of concern and respect for all his students. And the Jewish Voice for Peace Advisory Council has just, Academic Advisory Council has just been formed. I'm proud to be a member of it. There's over 500 of us. Um, and it was formed specifically to fight the censoring of academics around the country who criticize Israeli government policies as part of the struggle for Palestinian rights. And the last example I'm going to give now, and certainly as part of the Q&A, if you have other examples, I invite you to share them with us. Um, and this is at UC Davis near me in California. On Thursday, January 29th, the non-binding advisory resol resolution was passed by the Associated Student Senate of the University of California at Davis in an eight to two vote calling on the UC system to invest, to divest from corporations that aid in the Israeli occupation of Palestine, naming Caterpillar again, and also Raytheon who makes the weapons, some of the weapons that killed Palestinians by the Israeli army. At the divestment hearing, the UC Davis students supporting divestment specifically told their sto stories while underlining that divestment was targeted not at anyone on campus, but at severe violations of Palestinian human rights, emphasizing their opposition to all racism and bigotry. 
but opponents of the BDS resolution accused the senators of engaging in hatred and led a walkout, sabotaging the chance for civil dialogue. The following Saturday, two red swastikas were painted, spray painted on the Jewish fraternity at UC Davis, Alpha Epsilon Pi. Immediately, the Students for Justice in Palestine, the Arab Student Union, the Muslim Student Union, the Pakistani Student Union condemned the swastika, saying, this reminds us that anti-Semitism still exists and is rampant on our university campuses. They also said, we reject any attempts to blame this on any single student community, including the UC Davis divestment movement. But right away, the local paper, the Sacramento Bee, linked the two incidents. The fraternity vice president said he didn't think it's a coincidence that the swastikas happened right after divestment, implying that the divestment movement was inciting anti-Semitism. Though a few days later, the same fraternity vice president said he appreciated all the student groups who'd reached out to the fraternity, and he downplayed the timing between the divestment vote and the swastikas, saying, it's tough to have it all happen in one week, but a direct link is unfair. A leader of Jewish Voice for Peace's Sacramento chapter wrote a letter that was printed in the paper decrying how the newspaper linked the divestment resolution and the swastikas. And he said the divestment resolution was not aimed at anyone on campus, but at human rights violators, adding some clearly want to imply it was critics of Israeli policies whom they seek to tar as anti-Semites. Then there was a letter in the student newspaper by a group called Jews for Divestment, and they wrote, Criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitism, and we reject all attempts to, com to cobble these incidents into a false narrative. Now, in a minute, we're going, to, I'm going to we're going to share with you some more readings from my book, but I've been putting out a lot of ideas and thoughts here, and I want to take a pause, again ask you to turn to someone next to you, and you're each going to have a minute to share any thoughts in your head, feelings in your heart, you can share what you had for breakfast if you prefer. But just to, um, and it's one person share, and then I'll tell you when to switch. So just find somebody, and if there's not two of you, there can be three of you, just to share anything, any responses you're having to what I've been talking about. Thank you. Um, so internalized anti-Semitism, there's a lot of, about that, but just what I'm going to talk about here, it's about, partly it's about the behaviors that have been passed through our families in response to historic persecution, um, from the Crusades, uh, to the Inquisition, to the pogroms, to the Nazi Holocaust, leaving a lot of us with some kind of feelings of fear for our safety. And we might not even be aware that we feel that, but we might be worried a lot or anxious, or look over our shoulders a lot, you know, where I feel a sense of urgency. Um, there's a gay Jewish men's group in San Francisco, and um, they take Bobby McFerrin's song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, only they sing, Don't Be Happy, Worry. <laughs> and when I was giving these talks, someone told me another one, if you've ever heard about the Jewish telegram, start worrying now, details to follow. <laughs> yes. But, you know, we can turn the fear around. Um, I, I met with a group of Jewish women for a year, and that's where some of the stories in the book came from. And one of them talked about going to Germany. She was a musician and performing a concert for 2,000 people and coming out as a Jew on stage. And she said, it's the scariest thing I've ever done. My grandparents couldn't believe I would do that. But I could not be a Jew in Germany and not come out. Although my father instilled his own lack of safety in me, the work I'm doing is breaking that down. But the way the fear works is if we don't work through it and figure out how to release it, it sits in us and can distort our thinking, can freeze our thinking and confuse us as Jews sometimes into thinking that the horrific things that happened to us in the past are happening right now. And this is what I call our internalized victimization. And it's kind of the heart of the book. The chapter that most deals with this is called Taking Egypt Out of the Jews. Any of you who've ever been to a Passover Seder, you may remember that line that says, it was not enough to take the Jews out of, his, out of Egypt, we had to take Egypt out of the Jews. Um, because of the ways that Jews have been historically hurt, 
and attacked and exiled and raped and killed, um, there is a lot of trauma and suffering and pain that lives inside us until we can work through it, and I totally believe we can work through it. Um, my friends in the domestic violence movement have taught me the adage, hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. Any group, any group who has been traumatized, if we don't work through it, we can end up projecting it onto another group we've been taught to hate or fear, like Palestinians, like Muslims. I think this is part of the dynamic, a significant part of the dynamic that's going on in Israel right now, and also in this country around Islamophobia, and certainly Islamophobia is not just in this country sometimes from Jews. Um, our fear ripples out onto those who were not the ones who shipped us to camps, or shot us in shtetls, or torched us in medieval synagogues. This is not our fault, but it's simply not acceptable. We can do better. As horrendous as Jews' experience was, it didn't catapult us into exalted status. We're not the only people who have suffered, who feel vulnerable. And then what I think is really important is noticing how our Jewish trauma can be manipulated, like I was mentioning earlier in terms of Netanyahu with the violent attacks against Jews in Europe. It can be manipulated and has been by leaders, some Jews, some non-Jews, some in Israel, some in this country, encouraging us to still feel like victims because it serves their political agendas. You remember after 9-11 when George Bush said, you're either with us or you're against us? And he was manipulating fear to authorize him to bomb Afghanistan. That's what I'm talking about. Um, not meaning to be overly rhetorical here, but I think it's in the interest of US imperialism to keep Jews afraid to manipulate support for a militarized Israel, which translates to selling US arms supporting US hegemony in the Middle East with access to Middle East resources. Um, probably a lot of you know that the US sends over $3 billion in aid to Israel every year. 75% of it has to be spent in this country on corporations, and most of that goes to arms dealers. So who benefits from that? You know, the arms that, that killed the 2,100 Palestinians this summer, Apache helicopters, F-16 fighter jets, Hellfire missiles, armored personnel carriers. When we are afraid, we are most vulnerable to laying aside our moral compass, especially if we are made to feel that our lives are at stake. Some leaders manipulate Holocaust wounds until Jews believe catastrophe could happen at any moment. No wonder so many people support disproportionate force when they, when they are told they are under attack, even from groups whose weapons are negligible. And so victims can become victimizers. Says Rabbi Michael Lerner, the message of Torah is that cha the chain of pain can be broken, that we do not have to pass on to others what has been done to us. My friend and colleague Irina Klepvich teaches women's studies and Yiddish studies at Barnard. And she escaped the Warsaw Ghetto during World War II. She was only four years old. She escaped with her mother. And her father actually died leading the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Warsaw Ghetto survivor Irena Klepfist writes, my Jewish fears remind me that I have not left the tribe. I need to convince others of what I have to convince myself over and over again that we must choose justice despite our fears, that our fears are real, rooted in history, but they cannot control us or stop us from making just choices. We need to face the Israeli government's refusal to dismantle settlements, to end the occupation, to grant Palestinians human rights. We need to build a movement to push our government hard to pressure Israel to implement these goals. Not allowing fear to derail us, we remember that silence equals consent. When AIPAC and the Anti-Defamation League and the Jewish Federations press for misguided US policies that support subjugating Palestinians, our speaking out for Palestinian human rights as visible Jews has an impact far beyond our numbers. And that's why I'm a member of Jewish Voice for Peace. 
Just to reiterate, it's not our fault as Jews if we're run by fear, passed down through generations, but it's our responsibility to clean it up, to stop projecting Jewish trauma from the past onto Palestinians. And here's a few other readings from my book. I'm now in Iowa, showing slides of Israel and Palestine. Shira is president of the Campus Zionist Group, here because her religion professor assigned the class to come. And later the teach, teacher sends me Shira's paper, which reads, quote, I spent at least two of my four undergraduate years waging a propaganda war against a group of people I'd never actually spoken to or really even listened to. I spoke to a Palestinian man for the first time today. Our conversation was brief, but it meant everything in the world. I wonder if it meant anything to him. On my left was a Jordanian student who had a constant stream of tears running down his face throughout the slideshow, revealing a truly tragic sadness. I was able to feel it with him for the first time tonight. I'm not sure why tonight was different from any other night, a familiar question in my tradition, but, I get, but it was. I suppose something just needs to click inside a person before they're able to see beyond their loyalties. I hope this is just the beginning for me of realizing that the Palestinians, by virtue of being human, are entitled to as much as any other group. And I especially hope that others can bring themselves to transcend their sacred bonds before they're faced with tragedies of their own. And then I have a chapter called Jewish Positive. And I shine a light on Jewish resistance struggles and all the non-Jews who've been allies to us as Jews and how Jews have been allies. Did you know about intrepid, the intrepid Jewish visionary Dona Gracia Nasi? After failing to persuade the Pope to stop the Portuguese Inquisition, she mobilized an underground railroad to help hundreds of Jews escape. And then, during the Shoah, the Holocaust, one of the most courageous unsung heroes of the Jewish resistance was 19-year-old Rosa Robota. After seeing her own family march to the ovens, Rosa organized the smuggling that supplied dynamite that blew up the Auschwitz crematorium. Working in the camp munitions factory for months, Rosa and her friends carried out little wheels of dynamite which they hid in their bosoms and in the hems of their dresses. Our guide at Auschwitz said, they smuggle the dynamite in their fingernails. After her capture, as Rosa and her friends were hanged, she shouted, Chazak via mates, be strong and of good courage. Roska Karzakov, Karadzak, one of the chief partisans of Vilna, described her companions, quote, when I review the course of our work, I think constantly of the women. It was they who maintained contact between the ghetto and the city, using false papers, through the penalty, though the penalty was instant death. It was they who spread the idea of resistance and who later fought among the partisans. I want to tell you something about them. They were not extraordinary women, but, uh, sorry, they were not extraordinary women with special training. Those girls had to have a daily heroism, and they had it. To create an alliance with her Arab Muslim friend, Jamal, Terry Fletcher tells of her first visit to a mosque. Other Muslim friends lent her a hijab, a headscarf, and a long robe. Terry writes, during a break in the prayers, I agreed to take my former student to a store down the street to buy some sweets. The errands seemed innocuous enough at, the, at first, but as we stepped out onto the dark street, I realized with a, fr with a fright that I was walking around in public in full Muslim attire just two months after 9-11, when hate crime was against Muslims was rampant. Thankfully, nothing untoward happened, but walking that block to the store and back turned out to be far more terrifying than anything I experienced as a Jew. Terry is the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. After Terry's mosque visit, Jamal accompanied her to synagogue. What made their friendship work, Terry concluded, was that they were willing to reach across a divide, question their assumptions, and learn about each other's politics and cultures, to relinquish 
comfort zones. When Terry asked Jamal how it felt to be in her synagogue, he replied, the way you Jews pray is really different from how Muslims pray. But what we pray for is exactly the same. So the strategy of focusing on how Jews have resisted persecution and the non-Jews who've been allies to us and how we can be allies is part of that process of overturning the internalized victimization. And the whole last third of the book focuses on healing strategies, like activism. April 2002, when the Israeli army invades Janine refugee camp, in two days we organize a Jewish Voice for Peace civil disobedience action and public protest at San Francisco's Israeli consulate. Hundreds gather for the demo. The mood is outraged, but also upbeat, warm, connected, and visibly Jewish. We alternate anti-occupation chants with Israeli peace songs. After we shut down the consulate, then block the street, the police arrests us. Henry cries, we call on all Jews, speak up in your synagogues. Every Jew who is holding back for fear of hurting Israel is hurting Israel. As we are led to a police van, I remember the thank you in people's eyes. I remember how important it is in heart-wrenching times to create moments when we can feel our power, make a difference, feel connected to each other, in our mutual hunger for justice, activism as therapy. During the 2006 High Holidays, after shootings at the Seattle Jewish Federation, Seattle's Jewish activists held a Tashlich Litzedek ceremony, combining social justice and spiritual healing to address the complicated intersection of anti-Semitism and anti-occupation work. Tossing stones into Lake Washington on a sparkling sunny day, Jews cast off sins of the Israeli occupation. These allies cast away sins of anti-Semitism, ignorance about Jewish history and historical trauma, not speaking up against anti-Semitism, and equating all Jews with the policies of the Israeli government. The Tashlich idea? not just to rid ourselves of shortcomings, but to set a transformational intention, recommitting to something bigger. And to our non-Jewish allies, we need both your assurance and your critique. Whenever Jews are attacked, blamed, or silenced, we need you to speak out, to bear in mind our history and not abandon us. At the same time, Israeli-American and third-generation Holocaust survivor Liat Weingart asked Presbyterian Church allies, quote, we need you to persist in seeing the best in us and expecting it of us. Don't let us get away with anything less than what we're capable of. We know you feel bad about what happened to Jews, but we need you at our side as partners in our liberation. And we will not be truly liberated as long as we are occupying the Palestinians. When my friend Julia Kaplan and I lit an activist training about anti-Semitism, Julia said, more Jews will work for justice in Israel and Palestine once they know that their allies are as committed to fighting anti-Semitism as they are to ending the occupation. July, July? Mm -hmm. July 2010. Special U.S. Envoy to Combat Anti-Semitism, Hannah Rosenthal, was at a conference in Kazakhstan along with U.S. Special Representative to Muslim Communities, Farah Anwar Pandith. To spice up the presentation, they exchanged prepared speeches. Pandith condemned anti-Semitism while Rosenthal blasted an Islamophobia. Israeli historian Tom Segev wrote, it wasn't just a gimmick. Rosenthal believes that Jews cannot fight anti-Semitism by themselves, and Muslims cannot fight the hatred they experience by themselves. There is need for a joint war against racism. And I'm going to end with these two readings. Thank you so much for your attention. 
This first one was written by the youth wing of Jewish Voice for Peace. We are punks and students and rabbis and parents and janitors and freedom fighters. We remember brave, desperate resistance. We remember the labor movement. We remember the camps. We remember solidarity as a means of survival and an act of affirmation, and we are proud. We refuse to knowingly oppress others, and we refuse to oppress each other. We will not carry the legacy of terror. We won't buy the logic that slaughter means safety. We commit to equality, solidarity, and integrity. We seek breathing room and dignity for all people. And this is my dedication to the book, and it's the end of the introduction to the book. Dedicating these pages to those who resisted in whatever ways they did, sneaking through holes in ghetto walls, stealing food, organizing, leaping off trains, burying what's precious, encouraging others, dynamite in their fingernails, singing. These are my people. Thank you. Thank you again for your attention. It's your turn. Opinions, um, questions, comments are welcome. Just ask you to please keep them respectful. Um, in, in Judaism, we have a statement, two Jews, three opinions. Uh, and you're going to be helping moderate, too, so anyone? Hi. Uh, so uh, there are many uh, Jewish social justice organizations that do not talk about Israel at all. Um, and I am wondering if you think that a Jewish social justice movement must talk about Israel, and does sort of Israel activism need to be sort of, does a, Jew, do, does a Jewish social justice movement inherently have to address Israel, or can it, it's, can it be defined in relation to being in solidarity with other movements? Like, why does, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you got the gist. Why does the Jewish Social Justice <laughs> Initiative have to deal with Israel as opposed to dealing with other things? Yeah, you weren't going to let me start with something easy, were you? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, deal with it all the time in the Bay Area with groups that do fantastic domestic work around, you know, whether it's, Solidarity with political prisoners or labor struggles, or but don't want to take a want to take a stand on Israel Palestine because of because it's divisive because we have two Jews three opinions um, and they don't want to lose people uh, so I understand that personally it's like I gave the quote at the beginning um, from Rabbi David Cooper that this Israel Palestine is the ethical issue for Jews in this century and I believe that so if I would wish that any Jewish group would, would figure out a way to talk about that, and it doesn't have to be the center of what they're doing, but to, to make some kind of statement about believing in human rights for all peoples. Um, I don't know what other people here think. It, it, it's a very tricky one, and I do understand why groups choose not to do that, but that's not my choice, and that's why I work with Jewish Voice for Peace and groups like that. Yes. The history of Israel, the history of Israel goes back uh, from the beginning where the United Nations, uh, uh, Britain, uh, United States, should not have allowed mm -hmm. to create a theocratic state. Mm -hmm. They sure should have allowed it for the Jewish to go back but not allow mm -hmm. a theocratic state mm -hmm. in the region. Mm -hmm. So from there, a chain of uh, intricate events, the reaction of the uh, Muslim for the aid, the war, all this complicated, uh, a long history. But uh, uh, a possible solution that everybody feels is that the president, democratic president in the United States, mm -hmm. at the second term, like was Clinton, yeah. and now Obama, mm -hmm. 
since it's not tied to election, could be more incisive and do something. Yeah. Clinton couldn't do it, and Obama has not done anything. The fact is that uh, there is a Zionist mafia in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I don't and feel OK about that term. I would prefer to not use that term, but uh, you could describe no, I it. I would use that term. I would use that term. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with that term. That doesn't, that's, there I, I is yeah. the industry of the war, multi-billion, but is also there, call it what you want to call, but the real term is a Zionist mafia. Yeah, I won't accept that term, yeah. but I hear that that's yeah, what you're using. It's true. Uh, it is. Right over there. Go ahead. Um, I think it's more of a corporate mafia. Yeah. And, um, you know, Lockheed is one group of louder, please. Could you speak louder? Speak over the speaker. Yeah. Talk louder. Well, I was just going to say, I think it's largely a corporate mafia. And um, yeah, some of the gangs are like Lockheed Martin, very violent gang. And um, as Penny was saying earlier, I think Zionism can mean a lot of different things. Um, Zelig Harris, for instance, who was a mentor of Noam Chomsky's, talked about socialist Zionism and they didn't want to create a nation state at all. I think what happens is faiths get co-opted by state powers. It certainly happens here in the US. But um, I wouldn't want to generalize Christians as part of a big Christian mafia, although I think there's an element to that. So I, I get your point. But there's also Christian peace workers and Jewish uh, liberation theologians. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. And and, go ahead. Oh, and I certainly agree. I do wish Obama, for all the reasons you mentioned, would take would do something strongly as you know in his last term here. I, he's he's taken some good stands recently, and I would, I would be thrilled if he would do some take a stronger stand. Um, around it, just ending the settlements, something like that. And thank you for your point about Islamophobia, uh -huh. because I think that is a huge issue. There's a lot of it going on on right wing radio and through DVDs like mm -hmm. Obsession. Mm -hmm. They distributed yes. 60 million free copies yeah, of a film right. called Obsession, yeah. which is horrendously anti Arab. But recently I've seen the Judeophobia developing through talk show hosts like David Ikes mm -hmm. and through some of the Mm. Not even so-called truth movement. I mm. think some of it has a very mm. racist and right-wing populist strain mm. to be careful of. The gentleman in the back, I know you asked earlier about having a question. Yes, um, just before I came here, I saw a speech, I think it's Secretary of State Rice. I just saw a speech before I came here on CNN by Secretary of State Rice, and she had said a figure that keeps popping in my head. $20 billion is what the Obama administration has spent in the last six years on military aid to Israel. And my question to you is, how can there be any change when there's so much money involved and there's such a codependent relationship between the United States and Israel with that kind of money flowing in? How are they not going to use weapons? How are they not going to stop the settlements when that kind of money's involved? That's yeah, it's a good question, and, and that's why various groups, including Jewish Voice for Peace and others, have consistently had a campaign, suspend military aid until the occupation ends, or some version of that. There's some ads on buses in San Francisco right now about it. I know Professor Joel Bainan um, at Stanford, Middle East Studies, who I have a lot of respect for, says things are going to change when somehow we're able to shift the balance of power, and not quite knowing how that's going to happen. Um, I mean, it, it feels so hard to think that we're going to actually convince the U.S. government to suspend the aid. Though, and maybe some of you can help me with this, I don't remember the exact, it was under the George Bush the first. Um, he threatened to suspend aid. Um, do you remember what the example was? It was something about the settlements? If, do you want to say it? Yeah, because I don't remember, but, but it actually happened and it was effective. Say it over the mic. Yeah. Israel is seeking $10 billion in loan guarantees, and Bush and Baker were very upset because every time Baker would go there, a new settlement would be announced just on Baker's visit. So Baker really got, and Bush both got very angry about this. And very quickly, uh, Bush went to Congress, went to the people, 
and said, look, I'm one guy against all these lobbyists and all these people in Congress. And he stood up and said he wouldn't give the loan guarantees until there was some action. And in 92, then, there was the election of Rabin. And so Shamir was out. So, it, I mean, if we can, I mean, I, it, so much comes down to grassroots work, too. You know, I think FDR was the first one who said it, and then Obama has repeated it. You know, when you have grassroots action, that does create change. I think that's what pushed Obama to make some statements about immigration reform. So, you know, it's movement building. That's what tonight's about. That's what the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center's about, Jewish Voice for Peace, many other organizations. So I hope that you will sign up on those lists if you're not on them already. Yes? Um, I'm concerned about um, some of the activism that's been happening in colleges. Uh -huh. um, and and um, I guess like SJP and um, some of the, S is it SPD sanctions? BDS. BDS. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that I've been, well, I just as a parent hearing from my children who are on the East Coast, um, is that there seems to be a desire on the part of a lot of students, both Jewish and not Jewish, mm -hmm. to support what they see as some, something that's going to um, call out a big wrong that's being done. And Pro that's good, but the problem with it is that um, many of these students join it like it's a club. They don't have full understanding of the history of the region. Um, they don't hear, they're hearing a lot of propaganda information at Reddit. I mean, on like the Tumblr webpage for Vassar College, which now has been stopped because they had um, a Nazi cartoon posted on it. But um, now they have a Facebook page. It's a little milder, but really, if you read, well, I read mm -hmm. that page, and I was sort of surprised because it was it was entirely one-sided and propagandist. And the problem um, that I had with that is, is the school is so progressive. People really weren't willing to come out and speak on behalf of Israel in any way or to um, give a counterpoint to these points that are being made. And so. Jewish, some of the Jewish students are hearing like, I'm just not going, I'm just going to avoid this. I'm not getting part of, being part of this. And while activism could be really therapeutic for some people, for the Jewish students, they're basically um, feeling a lot of attack and feeling as though nobody's defending Israel. And a lot of the people who are students who want to engage in a conversation with them about what's happening over in Israel have never been there. And don't understand this fully. Um, so I guess that I think it's really important that the word get out in education about what's happening there. But I do have some concern that a lot of what's happening is major, um, this is bad, let's stop it, as opposed to really understanding both sides and knowing the history and knowing what's OK to say to someone and what's not OK. You know, what, what, what is anti-Semitism and what isn't? Well, they don't get it. Yeah, and that's important, and that's you know, some of what I was trying to lay out here, and some of it's in my book, but I guess I'm just wondering, um, thanks for what you're sharing and for your experience. Um, if you, if, just because of the, the students I know on campuses who are talking about this do know what they're talking about. They've either been there, or they've read, or they've talked to Palestinians, and it's not, it gets called propaganda, but the truth is very painful about what's happening to Palestinian lives. And I think, and also when you talk about some Jewish students are scared, I mean, that's some, but I know there's Jewish students who are also fighting for Palestinian rights. And I just think, um, I certainly wouldn't support any kind of hate speech against anyone. And if there was a Nazi cartoon, that's, that's why I brought that up. That's not OK. And some of that also, you know, we have to educate each other. This is OK, just like you were saying, that's not OK. But I would just. I pro you know, I'm guessing that I would look at the same situation you're talking about and see it pretty differently. Because I think Palestinian human rights, you know, pe people's homes being, it's not to take away from Jewish students being scared or feeling whatever, but is that more important than Palestinian homes being demolished? No, it's not, but I'm just saying that it, maybe it's not a perfect, maybe, maybe the way it's being done mm -hmm. could be improved as well. Well, that may be, may well, but well be true, because I, I don't know the experience of Vassar, so I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. 
Yeah. Um, get some more women. Yes, you. Anti-Semitism <laughs> is never right. However, it's also very difficult um, when someone speaks out for human rights for them to be attacked by people calling them anti-Semitic when they aren't. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a really, really important point. As a Jew, <laughs> I'm accused of being a self-hating Jew. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all tied up with what you were speaking about on, on campuses as well, is we don't want to be anti-Semitic. It's wrong. And yet Jews need to be able to express an opinion that might be considered out of the mainstream by some Jewish people in this country. So I think that on both sides, it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and then as we know, there's not there. I mean, I was saying it before. There are, I think, one of the problems is the the Jewish uh, mainstream establishment acts as if it's the only Jewish voice, and that's one voice. But there are other Jewish voices in this country, and and they're getting actually gaining more visibility and and prominence, and that's I think a good thing. Yes, I've been over the past few years very. Uh, happy. Oh, okay. sure. Just so they can hear you. Uh, over the past few years, I've been very happy and impressed um, at the growth of Jewish Voice for Peace. And um, if you could tell us a bit more um, about that growth and also um, distinguish Jewish Voice for Peace from Americans for Peace Now and J Street because you guys have clearly felt the need to develop yourselves. Um, and I think that, I, I don't know the history really well, but I think that you are a younger, newer organization mm -hmm. than those other two. So I'd like to hear more about your perspective as one of the leaders of the group, um, the differences between and sure. similarities. In yeah, good question. And I'm, I'm real, I thought I brought JVP literature here, but I'm not sure I did. Um, I'm actually, I have been a leader in the past. I'm not now. I'm just a very active member, and I help lead our fundraising. But um, I think the sad truth is that JVP is the only national Jewish organization that actually calls for equal rights for Palestinians as well as Israelis. That doesn't seem so radical to me, but it's the truth. Um, J Street and APN also do good work. My, my understanding, because I'm on their email list, is it's, it's from the positionality of Jews and what's good for the Jews. And, and so they, they, they do often take good stands, like APN especially against settlements, but it's, it's not about equal rights for both peoples. And much to my horror, and I have to say this, at the Israeli assault on, on, on Gaza this summer, J Street backed it, and so did APN. JVP was the only national Jew, Jewish organization that condemned the Israeli assault on Gaza. And of course, the US stood behind that. I'm not trying to single out just Israel doing that. Um, and since you asked about the growth, actually, Tirtz and I were just talking about this. This summer, because of the stand JVP took, we gained 60,000 new supporters, online supporters. We now have 72 chapters, um, 200,000 hits on Facebook. And what I, that says to me, I mean, I, you know, I feel great about JVP. I think we do great work. But what I think that's about is that what we were talking about and trying to do it in non-demonizing language, but in human rights language, was that we were a lot of people in this country were just going, I've had enough, and this is what, um, you know, I, that we, you know, we need to take a stand here. Our, our uh, executive director, director Rebecca Lilcomerson, told me that well, she got an email from one rabbi, and on the subject line, it said, enough. And then in his body of this email, he said, sign me up. Um, so that's, that's, thank you for the question. Just want to see. Okay, let's take a few more. Yeah. Yes. You were mentioning the um, Jewish mainstream. Can you articulate, and this may be hard to do in just a few words, but can you articulate how the Israeli government justifies their position on how they treat Palestinians? Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you say that 
given that they're in power and have been elected, that uh, much of the Jewish mainstream of Israel must support them? Um, are you at all interested in answering that question? I don't want to put you on the spot. I just thought it was an Israeli, but if you don't want to do it, that's fine. I think you did earlier with the fear factor. It's, it's exactly the, 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 as far as I'm concerned, the trauma, the collective historic trauma is passed by as a marketing campaign for a political agenda. And it justifies... Repeat it through the mic or whatever. Just stand up and say it again. Thank you. I, I'm not um, informed more than, than, you know, I'm not an expert in the field, but as far as I can tell, that you know, Netanyahu in particular is using the, the exactly what Penny was discussing earlier about the, using the trauma of the past, the historic trauma, to justify these are the new enemies, these are the new Nazis, and, they're, and, and it's working very well. And his attempt is coming to DC now is to penetrate both political agendas in Israel, where he has an, an election in two weeks, for it to be not about the economic situation, the, the civil rights situation, anything that's going on in Israel, which is really on the agenda of, of most civilians, is, you know, is, is put aside because our lives are at stake and they're out to get us. And so they're tapping into fear just like they do here in the United States. Maybe even more so. Oh, yeah. Maybe more so. Thanks, Ami. Mean, I didn't mean to have you speak for all Israelis, but I just thought you could. You're, you, yeah, yes, and then you, and you'll next. You've mentioned fear uh, as a major factor in this problem, and I agree with you. Uh, given the um, responsibility of, from Soviet Russia through to Britain and the allies, victorious allies of World War I, mm -hmm. given so, um, Soviet Russia and the US's responsibility for the, and the United Nations, when it only had 65 members, given their responsibility for the status quo today in the Middle East, do you think there's a role for an apology to be advanced to the Palestinians in particular and the Muslim world in general, and a role for reparations mm -hmm. to try to reduce the personal passion that is so much a part of fear and therefore this problem? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think an apology would go a long, long way um, for the government of Israel to say, you know what, uh, there's a, a historian named Isaac Deutscher and he gave a great uh, metaphor. He said, imagine it's like People are escaping from a burning building and they're jumping on the backs of another people. And then he said, now, what would have been great is if they said, oh, oi, sorry, we jumped on your backs, we'll pay the medical bills, we'll restore your homes, we'll make it right. And that didn't happen. But I think if that could happen, like, you know, we screwed up, we made a mistake, we were escaping genocide, and we want to make it right. I, I think that would go a long way. I also just have to say, as, a, as a someone in the United States, I think if the U.S. government apologized for slavery and said, wow, we did a horrific thing to the Native peoples, to the black people, you know, I think that needs to be happen as well. So Israel is not the only place I think that we do that. If I could make it, uh, Just briefly, because yeah, we need course. to wrap up. I, I meant an apology from all those nations. Not oh, oh, okay, okay. That's, oh, yes, well, that would, be, that would be awesome, that would be awesome. You, and then we'll take one more. I think there is a lot of pointing being done at corporations. Corporations have become the new devil in the room, but the weight falls really on ourselves, and the center of it is our faith. Our faith is what perpetuates. For instance, the Jewish faith has the notion of the chosen people, which even the Christians adopt somewhat as being true. All of our faiths have that same idea of the chosen people, and all of us realize, most of us, I believe, pretend to have faith, and we really don't. 
But what we have really underneath is we realize that all these faiths are lacking. They can't really fulfill what is true. We can't hold to the faith and at the same time hold to the equality. And we are trying to find a way to reinvent that faith, find a faith that is more congruent with other people's faith, if you understand. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I really have a comment on that, but, but thank you for sharing your, your perspective. Um, just going to take one more. I actually wanted to hear if any women have anything else to say. We've been hearing from mostly men. Okay. Stand up, please. Stand up, Leslie and Harry. I was just wondering if you have any opinion about who to vote for president in 2016. Because I can't vote for Bernie Weider because he's wrong on Israel Palestine. Um, so is Elizabeth Walker. So, of course, Hillary Clinton. And it's going to be hard to not vote for the woman president, but not that hard because I really don't believe that much in gender stuff. But, um, you know, like, not that I believe that it's. It's a top-down kind of culture that, in reality, that we live. But nevertheless, I do need to vote for someone. Yeah. And I really don't know what to do. I voted for Obama last time, and I would take back my vote in a minute, but I can't. I mean, that's another whole discussion. You know, we don't know for sure who's running. We think it's probably Hillary and whoever. Yeah, but are there any that are pro-Palestinian? Yeah, and you know, I actually don't use those words because I really feel like it's pro peace and justice. I support Palestinians. I support. So I'm just saying. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, I forget the woman's name who's thinking of running again for the Green Party, um, but but I don't even know if she had that good of a stand on Israel Palestine. It's a conundrum. I can't remember her name. Jill Klein. Yeah, Jill Stein. Yeah. But I'm not sure if she, how good she was on Israel Palestine. Generally progressive and green. But I, you know what, we need to, we need, but you know what, Leslie, we need to wrap up. And so maybe I could talk to you afterwards because I just feel like our time, I don't, you know, I appreciate you all coming. Thank you very much. You can sign mailing lists here. And if you want to buy a book, Tom will sell it to you. Thank you.